Hey everybody, it's Mr. Keeper, and today we're going to continue our discussion about the Second Industrial Revolution and the innovations that come out of it by talking about, one, some of the inventions that continue to come out of this period, uh, some of the new sciences and the ways we approach our understanding of the universe, and also some new forms of expression and art that will also come out of this post-industrial age. Alright, so let's begin by just tossing some real simple things out there. It's during this time period that we see a lot of the modern innovations that are so iconic with our world today come to fruition. Things like the light bulb invented by Thomas Edison and eventually our understanding of the electrical system. First uh, direct current as discovered by Edison and then alternating current which replaces it discovered by Nikolai Tesla. Alexander Graham Bell will broadcast across the telephone for the first time ever. Uh, while there's a little bit of uh, controversy as to whether or not he actually invents a telephone, or he's actually just the first to use it, or maybe even not even the first to use it, but just took credit for all of it, we still associate Alexander Graham Bell with the invention of the telephone. Guglielmo Marconi invents the first radio uh, in London, and this is going to revolutionize communication around the world. Really, bringing together communities and nations and empires around the world uh, through radio. We also see the invention of the interchangeable parts system by Henry Ford during this time period. Uh, his association with the assembly line making the automobile much more affordable, which clearly is going to lead us towards the creation of flying cars, which is just inevitable. In fact, they're now estimating that's only like two years away, so FYI, flying cars are coming. We also have our first airplane flight. The Wright brothers in North Carolina will have the first flight. It's only about 20 or so seconds, but it is still the first time humans have had a sustained flight that is generated from an invention of ours and not just falling out of the sky. Louis Pasteur will develop his concept of what germs are and his exploration of sanitation when it comes to surgery. And as you guys are aware, because we've already talked about Lister a little bit, uh, he realizes that if you clean the tools during surgery, you actually help prevent disease from killing your patient, which is going to dramatically improve the survival rate of surgery. Kind of great uh, in comparison to the way things were before, where you almost inevitably got an infection and then died. So we see some dramatic innovations coming out of this period, and it's going to continue in applying these things to large cities, such as using the ideas of Louis Pasteur to kind of help us to realize the danger of disposing human waste in public areas. So we come up with sewer systems, and we come up with plumbing scenarios that actually allow us to filter water so that we're not just disposing waste in large bodies of water like rivers, lakes, and seas. So we're seeing significant improvements in our understanding of the world and technology. Which means there's going to be less crap all around, which is always a good thing. Alright, so how are we radically changing our understanding of the universe? Well, that comes with just a completely new philosophy of the universe. So the 20th century is going to really look at how humans understand things. And a man by the name of Ernst de Mach in his Science of Mechanics is going to realize that what we know of the universe might not be true. All we know is our perception of the world and the universe. And we will only ever know that. Uh, that's just kind of the reality of human existence. So, if that is the case, we may not be able to understand the absolute laws of the universe. What we can do is understand how we perceive the absolute laws of the universe. So we're going to start to apply things like relativity to human understanding of things. And that's a pretty radical change. The notions of absolute yeses or noes are maybe going to be set aside a little bit. And maybe it's just best understanding things as we can comprehend them. And this is going to change a lot of stuff. We start to see developments in things like radiation. Uh, if you saw the play a while ago, we did a play on the Radium Girls. Well, that's telling the story of people like Marie Curie, the woman who helped discover radiation by experimenting for years with the isotope of radium. Well, we realize, unfortunately for Madame Curie, that radiation is something that is incredibly harmful to the human body. 
We learn this through not only her studies, but also from the fact that she kept a bar of radium next to her bed for, you know, a few years, and it caused significant radiation poisoning. We also start to understand the basic workings of an electron through the works of J.J. Thompson, and we start to map out the electron, the neutron, the proton start to look like. And because of this, we're starting to understand the world of energy, which had been pretty vague and kind of unknown to us at this point. And with this better understanding of energy, we start to realize that there are more opportunities to create energy and also more applications to energy that we may not have known prior. So people like Max Planck will start to question how energy really works and how uh, transferring of energy takes place and what can we actually learn about energy. Werner Heisenberg states that we can actually only know one aspect of energy in any given time. Uh, when we start to look for multiple variables of the exact same particle in existence, we start to have too many unknowns. That mean that the best we can ever do is get a close approximation of what energy is actually doing. So again, we're starting to look at this more relative understanding of the world. We can't necessarily find absolute concrete proof of things because we just can't yet. So we're getting relative similarities, closeness to what we think is actually how things behave. Well, then we take that to an entirely new level with Albert Einstein this theory of relativity. In his theory of relativity, what he points out, and we're actually going to look at a graphic now, uh, and this graphic is actually a little flawed. You can see some grammatical mistakes in here, but kind of move past it. The base message is there. The idea that if you have two objects and nothing else, it is not possible to determine which object is moving and which object is standing still. There's no way to establish what perspective is when you only have those two objects. And the reality is, is that that's really how all of the universe works. Unless you have more than one data point to start being able to put pieces together, that perspective, that relativity uh, is, is really subjective. And once you start getting into the nuances of relativity, you can start to look at how our impact and our perspective of things starts to vary based on various forces in the universe, particularly one force that plays upon everything in the universe, and that's gravity. And then we can start to distort our perception of what is really happening based on gravity because the greater amounts of force of gravity starts to have impacts on time. And we are not going to spend a lot of time talking about that because my head already starts to hurt after 30 seconds of talking about it. So... Reality is, science completely revolutionized during this time period. Our understanding of the universe, the complexities of the universe, of energy, of time, matter, everything is changing at a tremendous rate. Well, on the flip side of things, outside of just changes in science, we also see changes in art during this time period. Uh, we start to see two new focuses come out of this period, one of which is going to be realism. Instead of looking at the romantic view of things and kind of idealizing nature, idealizing different aspects of humanity, realism is just, boom, this is what the world is. These are the problems that exist in the world. We are flawed. The world we live in is flawed. It's kind of full of suffering and some pretty awful things. Let's portray that. And then we also have naturalism, which is kind of the literary form of realism, where we see stories like what happens in Charles Dickens' works, a very flawed industrialized world where there's poverty and children suffering and crime and corruption. And we're willing to address those topics for the first time. Hey, this is what it is. It's not necessarily saying that it's wrong or we are wrong or people are evil or passing any sort of judgment. It's just like, hey, this is what the world is right now. Let's lay it out there. Let's look at these topics that were kind of faux pas before. Topics like alcoholism or prostitution. Topics like poverty or uh, the hardships of romantic love. So realism and naturalism are going to kind of put those to the forefront of what's going on. And let's look at some of this. I mean, here you can see a depiction of just people living their lives. They're sitting in a train station waiting for the train. You can kind of tell somewhat of what's going on based on the fact that you have a different orientation of people. They're sitting around something waiting. Uh, 
there's no happiness here. It's just people living their lives. Or we have people working. You see happiness in the, the face of the man who's breaking rocks together. Uh, you kind of get the impression this is hard work, that people are just living this life. It's not enjoyable, but it's reality. And then we have the modernism movement. So modernism is kind of a, an offshoot of the realist concept. So we start to look at realism and realize that sometimes it's hard to look at the world as it is and those problems that exist. And modernists are like, hey, we're just going to make things that look cool and pretty. Uh, they don't want to deal with the social issues that come with realism. They don't want to deal with prostitution or poverty. They just want things to be aesthetically beautiful. And they're trying to kind of avoid a lot of the morality of just anything. Take morals, take everything out of it. This is about pure aesthetics, pure look, pure enjoyment. And we have some interesting people that come out of this time period. People who, like the Bloomsbury Group, who are going to be incredibly affluent individuals who start to have a pretty significant role in the world. And they start to change how we view things on a social level because they're not really applying the morality of things. They're doing things for the aesthetics. How does it look? And they start to apply this to a lot of different things. And these people are very well off and they're incredibly powerful. And they will start to change just human interaction a little bit. People like John Maynard Keynes, who's an economist, probably the most significant economist of the modern age, who is a firm believer of a very proactive, we're going to skip the video that comes along with this, a uh, very proactive government when it comes to economic situations. And Keynes and his model does not care about, you know, developing a, a large national debt or anything else later on. It's about the apparent view of a, a government that has to work to improve people's lives. All right, let me phrase this a little bit differently. Put it out this, uh, this way. If there is a problem in a government, or there's a problem in a nation economically. And we decide to not take action and people suffer. That's not okay. It's not not okay because morali morally that's wrong. It's because that looks bad. And when that looks bad, it starts to lead to other repercussions later on. Like, if it looks like a government is choosing not to help its citizens during times of economic distress, then it looks like they're ineffective, and therefore they'll lose power. And this is going to be significant in how most modern nations apply economic theory to their nations. During times of economic trouble, the government must intervene to make it seem like they're doing something to improve people's lives. And that's the responsibility, and also that is what the appropriate perception should be. All right, so there's a wonderful video here you should watch in class. It's a great rap. We'll, we'll watch it. It's fun. All right, and then we also have another form of art that comes out of this. And I realize we have just inundated you with a lot of art. You have realism, you have modernism, and now we're going to have impressionism. But to be truthful, impressionism is probably every student's favorite form of art because it's the form of art that's all about you. How do you view the world. Uh, it is the response to realism. And it will depict everyday life like realism, but the idea behind it is that you are painting your impression of what is going on. Your view, you are capturing a single moment in time. It's like you're taking a photograph, but instead of just taking a photograph and portraying things as they were, you're taking a photograph and portraying it how you perceived it. And some of the greatest European artists of all time are Impressionist artists. Claude Monet, Manet, Degas, and of course Vincent van Gogh, who's technically a post-Impressionist, but still influenced by the movement. So let's look at some of this art. Uh, so this is, again, capturing that single moment in time. People sitting outside and enjoying the day. 
there's a lot of actual fun discussion to be had about this actual image, and we'll talk about it in class, or if we did already talk about it in class, I hope you enjoyed it, uh, about the idea of human interaction and how humans relate to the world around them. And Impressionism does allow for a lot of symbolism. It is your personal experience, your personal impression of what the artist is trying to show you. And this gives us a lot of this kind of discussion back and forth on what the intent of the artist was. We, of course, have Monet's Water Lilies, one of the most famous paintings of all time. Uh, this image, which is a bit controversial in its nature, of the bartender who may or may not actually be a prostitute. Or, of course, Starry Night. Uh, the one of many masterpieces of Vincent van Gogh where he's portraying his perception of a night. Granted, this is only a fragment of Starry Night, uh, but it's tremendous and kind of personally my favorite painting of all time. So we see a lot of changing during this time period, and it's only become more and more radical. The idea of perception kind of playing a role in art is going to continue to push art farther and farther away from that realist notion. Impressionism only leads us on to future forms of post-impressionist art, like Cubism uh, in the early 20th century, where we just abandoned the entire third dimension of art. And you only depict it in two dimensions, and you do it in very static shapes. And that allows for that impression aspect to it, but at the same time gives you an entirely different perspective on what's going on. And this will be artists like Brock and Picasso who paint in this very unique form. This is one of Picasso's famous pieces, Guarnica, La Guarnica. And it's there's a lot going on here. Uh, the lack of depth is something that really plays with the human perception of what reality is. And a lot of this cubist movement is done as a response to the events that are taking place in Europe where we start to depart from reality because reality is so painful as in what's happening in World War I. And with that, boom goes the dynamite and we are done. Thank you and have a great night.